Welcome to Season 4 of Purposeful Empathy, a show dedicated to conversations with people from around the globe who understand the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode is brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I am joined by Charles-Antoine Barbeau-Meunier, who is a soon-to-be medical graduate from Sherbrooke University in Quebec with training in media studies, sociology, and neuroimaging. That confluence is not um, very, um, you know, common. As an active scholar of empathy, he has given training for empathy training and continuing education to healthcare professionals and executives across Quebec to prevent compassion fatigue and to promote empathy in healthcare. Charles Antoine has also modeled empathy in the context of social crises such as climate change and COVID-19. Can't wait to unpack that. And very exciting, in a couple of months, Charles Antoine will begin his medical residency in psychiatry in the city of Toronto. Welcome to the show, Charles Antoine. Hi. Well, thanks a lot for, for inviting me, for thinking about my, uh, my work on empathy. I'm really happy that I'm here. You have studied um, empathy in relation to crises, the climate crises, uh, crisis and COVID. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah. So when I worked on my master's thesis on, uh, on empathy, well, I wanted that to be linked to something very tangible. And so I worked on the uh, climate crisis at the time. And the idea is that if we're facing a social crisis and all of these crises have a social component, right? Like even if the climate crisis is tied to an ecological crisis, a biodiversity crisis as well, it's also a failure of our society to change its consuming patterns, to change uh, its relation to the environment. So if we're going to have to change our behaviors, if we're going to have to change the way that we do politics and our economic system, we're going to need a lot of collaboration and a lot of social cohesion to carry that change. And if we meet resistance up there from the politicians or the elites that have more of a say on, on these policies, then if we need bottom up change, if we need people to, uh, if we need people to, in a sense, build a critical mass so that we have, we can weigh these policies in our, in our direction, then we need cohesion and we need concern for the common good together. Now, all of that to say that this is precisely what empathy can channel. When you empathize with others, um, you, it's not just about understanding how they're feeling or why they're feeling that way. It's also understanding how the environment shapes their well-being and shapes who they are. And so in a sense, uh, if you want other people's well-being, you also want uh, that the, what we can call common goods. So the social environment they're in, uh, the health that we have uh, and the environment, we, we, the, like the natural landscapes that we have access to, all of these are preserved and protected. So empathizing with others is also in a sense, empathizing with uh, the environment. So if you develop or cultivate empathy throughout society, you're cultivating an ability, a collective ability to care for one another, to care for the environment, and to drive policies that are mindful of the, again, the common good and the future generations. And uh, so that's how it all ties together. You remind me of, um, I want I think it's Jane Fonda or Gloria Steinem. It's one of those two women who talk about ra uh, empathy being a radical. And, you know, I often say that empathy uh, has innate qualities. It's spiritual by nature and it's political by nature. And I think what you're talking about is the politics of it. Like when you empathize, 
you are expressing a dissatisfaction with the status quo because other people are suffering or the environment is suffering and you want change, right? So that's what I'm hearing. You know, I don't know why it came into my head, but I right now as we're taping this, and I know this is only gonna air in a few weeks, but right now, these last few days has been about the absolute COVID crisis in India. And in the same period, I'm starting to see on my feed like the Economist just came out with an article. I can't read it because I haven't subscribed, but the headline is basically, we're in for the roaring thirties again. Like we're in for party, party, party. Everybody's excited. We're past the COVID uh, peak and it's in our, you know, it'll be in our rear view mirror and, and let's party and let's get together. And everybody's gearing up for, you know, July 1st or July 4th, whichever country you're in. And, and they're seeing kind of the, the, the hope. Meanwhile, on the other side of the planet, we are just about to hit the worst of it, where, you know, they're estimating upward of 2 million Indians may die of, of COVID. So how can we, in one context, um, stay open to empathy with humanity, given everything that we've also endured over the last, you know, 12 months? It hasn't been easy on anyone. Yeah, you see the way you frame this highlights how complex the the, the situation is. Uh, and, and I want to say the headline is a is a bit of an abomination <laughs> in terms of public health, goodness, because one of the biggest issues we face now is inequity with vaccines, right? We don't realize that unless we're all in this together, unless everyone can have access to vaccines, nobody's really out of that situation. And so we can party like there's no tomorrow when, the, when, when we're all vaccinated here and we think that this is done with. But of course, the way this virus behaves with the mutations, uh, the variants, and we know that this is going to come back and the vaccines we have are not going to function necessarily, but this is, this is not what the interview is about. Right. So bringing it back to empathy, what I like the way you frame this is you, um, you really highlighted that we've had a rough time and in a sense, we're entitled to having now a bit of a break in a sense. And so maybe that opens the door, right. To self, empathy, self-compassion. Um, so that is one of the things that complexifies empathy the most is that when people are distressed, when people are on the verge of burnout, uh, mentally speaking, we are poor at empathy when our brain is undergoing stress like this. Our attention turns inwards. We are mostly investing our resources in regulating our emotions and stabilizing and being functional in adverse conditions. And so if anything, having a bit of a break, it can be, can be like, is something we need and it can be good in the sense of freeing up empathy as well. At some point we can stop empathizing just because we need help ourselves. Right? So this is where self-compassion comes in. Uh, and, and we always point out that it's just like the oxygen masks in, in, in airplanes. And you, I'm sure you've heard this before, right? You have to put on your oxygen mask before you help others. So there's a lot of that aspect. Uh, but I just want to add quickly that at the same time, this can be a bit inconsequential. And this is where empathy has to maybe be coupled with a bit of maturity or humility, or at least the objective of empathy is first and foremost to decenter from ourselves and have an open mind to other experiences of the world. And this is what we need right now when we look at the situation in India or other, like just Latin America is faring extremely poorly right now. Um, and so if we just look at ourselves and the fact we're happy that these vaccines are going to give us a break now, and we don't look at the global picture that we're hoarding vaccines that are preventing other countries from accessing uh, basic public health measures in, in that situation. Well, 
the problem is not going to get any better and we'll only feel good at the expense of others in a sense. So maybe empathy right now is a lot about action. What some people have called social empathy, for example, is that it needs to be coupled with social action, that empathizing more globally, looking at social inequities, having empathy broadly right now means understanding that our privileges are tied to oppressive situations elsewhere in a sense, or at least uh, highly disadvantageous circumstances. So that's why it's so complex. We need self-compassion, but we don't want that to fall into complacency where we are creating more inequities. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad we, I asked that question because that was a very uh, nuanced and thoughtful answer. So I'm really taking away from that, that, okay, we need to take care of ourselves, right? That's part of the process in having the capacity to empathize. But as you say, if we're going to adopt some social empathy and be um, mature about the circumstance, we got to step up and practice purposeful empathy because other people are suffering. So, you know, we got to do both. We got to take care of ourselves and we got to take care of, of others because it's, 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 situ- it's a situ- serious situation. Um, I want to ask you about uh, more about self-compassion, especially within the healthcare system, because that's where you've been doing a lot of work lately. But I think there's a need for a bridge question because we just talked about you doing a, a master's in sociology and then you started med school. Um, you know, that's, you went from broad system to individual, you know, anatomy of a body. What made you decide to become a doctor? Huh, maybe, maybe the easiest way is to, is to pick up on what I mentioned before the social empathy aspect. Um, I felt I got a better understanding of society through sociology, I, I, I saw a lot of how structurally speaking institutions are, are complex entities and <laughs> how a lot of our social inequities, uh, how those are embedded in, in our society. And, our, and, and I wanted to change that. And so that's how I moved to medicine. First and foremost, these social inequities are all tied to health disparities. And so the social determinants of health, um, broadly speaking, are a huge concern for me. But I'd add what I've called sometimes the micro social determinants of health or the emotional determinants of health. Um, empathy itself, you know, is tied to our health. So in the clinic, we know that having more empathy or just benevolence or compassion with patients um, leads to a, a, a better interview, uh, more compliance to uh, treatment. It leads to more trust between the patient and the healthcare provider. It decreases anxiety. Uh, it decreases pain. It shortens hospital stays. It improves the immune system. There's so on and so forth. Empathy is a determinant of health in that, in that sense, right? Um, but then again, to bring back the social empathy aspect, physicians and just healthcare professionals generally have maybe more trust from the population in terms of, you know, we are here for the common good and we're here for people's health. So we have a privileged voice in a sense so if you want things to change, not only are we trusted, not, not only do we have this privilege that I think comes with responsibilities, but at the same time, health is a powerful argument for change. And right now I've, I've, I've been working on the climate action front and the health impacts of climate change are a powerful argument for policies that are good for the environment. If we just look at pollution, that just pollution increases CO2, these emissions increase CO2, but at the same time, pollution is responsible for over 10,000 deaths a year in Canada, for example. So um, so that's how it, it all ties together is 
I had a better understanding of society, but I think as a healthcare professional, I, I was in a good position now to make change happen and maybe live up to my, my words. So you were really coming at the, the profession of medicine from a social justice perspective is what I'm hearing. Would, you, would that be a fair way of putting it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's more things to it as well. I, I, I wanted to be close to human beings in the clinic because in, in academia, otherwise you can spend a lot of time with your books or computer, uh, maybe the classroom, but I wanted that connection, uh, the narratives. I was reading a lot of Oliver Sacks and these beautiful narratives between a, a physician and the patients and these stories of illness. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to be part of that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious to know, you, you, you just completing, you've got exams coming up. You're just completing your med school training. What has uh, surprised you about your med school training, given that you are an empathy researcher in a positive way and then in a less favorable way? Wow, that, that is a question I, I, I wish I'd been asked before. It's, it's a great question. So obviously, having all this, uh, these social sciences before medicine completely changes my, the way I look at things. And I like to think that, yes, I, I, I've been a medical student, like able to practice medicine, but I was also an undercover social scientist. And so I was always looking at how the healthcare curriculums or how the practice of healthcare in in hospitals how what did that say about empathy so one positive thing i realized is well there's a lot of studies that have documented there's a decline in empathy throughout med school and so at first you you think wow this is terrible you're taking very empathetic people uh, and you're just taking that sensibility away from them as they get into that role. But in fact, what I realized is that is not the full picture. And there's an eloquent study by the city and Smith, uh, I think four years ago came out that showed empathy improves throughout med school, actually, because of all that exposure you have to people in vulnerable situations or in pain, um, it improves your perception of pain. It improves your ability to, 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 to feel what other people feel in a sense. And it also improves your cognitive empathy. So you can understand where they're coming from because you've carried so many medical interviews and you've become an expert at listening. I mean, that's basically what you're trained to do is listening to patients. So wh what I loved to realize is actually your empathy improves in terms of the capacity. The downside is uh, why did these studies show that empathy declined then? Is that even though you're more competent, in a sense, you're more sensitive, your cognitive empathy is, is more sensitive as well, um, it's not expressed it's not translated into behaviors. And so when you measure the empathy of medical students or physicians, it seems there is a decline because even though they're more empathetic, potentially it's not translated into behaviors. And so that's the downside is I realized how uh, compromising the environment can be in expressing empathy. I, I mean, of course, we have an idea how busy it is in healthcare, but when you're there and when you're the one being or not being as empathetic as you'd like, then you realize what's really happening is how the time constraint uh, puts a lot of stress on you. You have pressure to see so many patients in little time, um, getting evaluated constantly. Everything I do uh, technically gets evaluated at, at the end of the month. Uh, you get a report 
And that can affect your chances of matching to a certain residency, for example. So every day you have this pressure to behave in a way that is productive and conforms to very high expectations of, of performance. At the same time, you neglect your well-being, you neglect your social relations, which are definitely a foundation of our well-being. You can. I, I personally didn't. Uh, I, I worked hard not to, but a lot of people neglect their sleep quite a bit. Uh, just their day-to-day -day hygiene of, of doing, you know, sports and being active. So you're in a situation, to put it simply, where you're asked to see the humanity in others, but you're trained to dehumanize yourself uh, day after day. And so that potential for empathy is there, but it's very hard to uh, translate into behaviors strictly speaking, because you're conforming to uh, very high professional expectations. So that would be the downside of it. But there's hope, right? Because the potential is there. We just need to change the whole healthcare paradise. <laughs> <laughs> just that, just that. Okay, but so now this begs the question, right? Because you've just talked about medical training. You've obviously been doing uh, rounds and, and, you know, you're, 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 you're on the job training. You're now doing a lot of training. You were doing that even before COVID, but now I, I imagine that the, the need is ever greater, um, on practicing self-compassion and self-care because of the high rate of burnout anyways, within the, you know, the delivery of healthcare. So can you tell us a little bit about that training, uh, please? Yeah. So, I'm going to take the short route. <laughs> uh, basically, the model that I designed in my master's highlighted five components of empathy, which are pillars of empathy. Uh, so very quickly, these are the quality of your presence when you're with someone. So that was the face. Uh, then there's resilience, which is our emotional regulation. Then there's attention, the way we attend to others. Uh, the quality of our attention determines the accuracy of our empathy, in a sense. And then there's the social ties that we have. So, again, people we identified with better, uh, we tend to empathize more with. And then we should ask ourselves, with humility, uh, are there groups that we, we don't really identify well with and that are cut off from our empathy just because we we know nothing of their reality or that we have stereotypes about them. And finally, there's the fifth component is just the global culture that's around. So that could be very global, say like a, uh, like a Western point of view that tends to be more individualistic thinking of the consequences of our actions on ourselves versus if you look at Eastern uh, cultures, especially Southeast Asia, where uh, it's more, what are going to be the consequences of my action on others? And it's more of a collectivist mindset, for example. And I know that the picture is much more complex. It's not just black and white that way, but it's just a way to understand how our culture around us can shape our behavior. Healthcare is a culture, right? Um, so these trainings are about exploring these five components and trying to identify how each of these plays out in the healthcare field. So this is not a training about learning, you know, to take care of yourself all that much because there's a lot of that in healthcare. And it's part of the problem is that in face of all the distress, the solution that's been put forward for decades has been to tell people just to find a better work and life balance. And the responsibility is rested on their shoulders. It's because you're not, you know, finding that balance. So you should be more, again, you, you should be more empathetic to yourself. Go, you know, have a nice bath and take care. And I value self-empathy and compassion immensely. But in that context, it's not enough uh, when there are structural obstacles to that self-empathy in the first place. You have to conform to high, like very high pressure of delivering care. Uh, and basically everything is 
pushing so you neglect your well-being, but then you're being told that you should not. So this training then, it does put forward self-empathy and compassion in part of the resilience part, that this is part of our well-being, it's part of our resilience, but it includes that ingredient in a broader recipe that all other components have to be looked at as well. So uh, it's better to have good face-to-face contact. Whereas now with electronic medical records, we would tend to just be in front of the computer typing the whole meeting with the patient and having very little eye-to-eye contact. And then at the end of the day, we feel like we haven't connected with people. It's kind of a natural consequence of that. So being mindful of having, you know, good contact with others as a kind of day-to-day hygiene um, is another example. And then if we look at a component that is uh, attention, well, not having too rigid of an attention when we look at patients, uh, we tend to look at patients in terms of a disease. We're trying to find the right diagnosis and we have all these algorithms in our head. Uh, And then we are almost functioning like an autopilot where we have this symptom and it trickles down to these possibilities. Uh, So we lose that ability to pay attention to a person's feelings and their narrative and all these aspects that build trust and are part of the healing process too. So these are examples of, you know, what is part of the training to, 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 to nurture empathy, but still, as I said, again, the biggest constraints are structural ones. So looking at the culture overall, it's about changing the culture in medicine and in healthcare. Um, The CMA, the Canadian Medical Association Association has been keen on that now. The word is out. Uh, The last time that they held a physician wellbeing conference, that was the thematic, was changing tides, changing that culture. So we're no longer pinpointing that responsibility on, on, on individuals. Now we're understanding we have to make, bring structural changes. And then COVID happened. So <laughs> it's not a time to, I mean, it is a time for, for these changes. It's just, it's just we, we, in terms of priorities, we have to, we have to face this crisis. Uh, so I just hope that this will highlight how fragile we are in terms of our well-being in terms of burnout something i mean it's common sense it's been decades in the making that we know we have like a high rate of suicide compared to other professions we have one of the highest rates of burnout as well uh so i mean it's a it's an occupational hazard of being in healthcare is just burnout is an occupational hazard so um we just need to be mature enough now to hone up to that and change that structurally again, advocate for that change very strongly instead of advocating for better salaries. And I'll end on that note that this is, this is part of why the negotiations are difficult right now with the, the, the the government is it's promising maybe uh, bonuses uh, in terms of salary, but the problem and what people really need is not bonuses. They want better working conditions. They want to feel safe when they're at work. They want to feel that say nurses won't have 40 patients under their care where they feel that they can't provide the quality of care that they are here to provide. Uh, We're suffering from moral injuries of having having a desire to care for others and we don't have the structural means to do so. And this is what we want to change. Wow. 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 This. Okay. So I have one more question, but I just need to, to, to say, say this has been such a deep conversation. There's just so much to digest. Um, I'm going to listen to the, to the interview again and and really reflect more on what you've said. Um, I like to, end our conversations these days with my guests with um you know flipping the the switch a little bit and asking can you remember a time when you were on the receiving end of empathy uh purposeful empathy uh and what that meant for you what uh, what did that feel like and why was that important yeah so 
Uh, the best example for me is, 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 is a current one and it's, it's fairly recent. Um, so I've had a uh, shooting like sciatic, sciatica, uh, leg pain for about a year now. And I just, you know, highlighted how difficult it is in healthcare that you're constantly evaluated and assessed for your productivity or ability to offer high standards of care. And it's very hard to, to, to manage with that pain. That's a bit, that's been at times uh, quite debilitating. So you always feel like it's keeping you from uh, achieving these high standards and that you're going to suffer in your you know, your evaluation and you just hope, you just really hope that you're going to have a supervisor that's understanding. Uh, and that won't see that as just, you know, a ridiculous complaint or a sign of weakness, because that's a lot of what healthcare is, right? Whenever we don't conform, we, we are made feel, we're made to feel like we are either weak or, uh, not suit for the, for the work. Um, but I've had this amazing supervisor, uh, And he had gone through that problem. He had had that pain in the past to the point where he couldn't sleep, couldn't operate either. uh, Because, I mean, in surgery, you have to stand up (laughs) for a long amount of time. Um, And what a relief that was, honestly, to finally feel like talking about my issue that was very personal and on my mind all of the time uh, wasn't just going to be an awkward moment. It wasn't just going to be about, all right, let's negotiate for a kind of middle ground that, that, you know, I'm uncomfortable with. It was just someone who cared about that issue. uh, And definitely his priority was you shouldn't go through that pain So whatever boundaries you're comfortable with, let's figure it out. Let's work that way. We'll arrange something that, you know, can make better use of your competencies while not, not unleashing this, this pain every day. So that was such a relief knowing again, that you're being evaluated every day for that. And there's so much pressure to conform and to, to be prolific in what you do. So uh, that empathy was a huge relief after, I would say after a whole year of having that issue, uh, he was the only person that really took it to heart. So that after, as I said, after a year, that was a huge relief for me. Well, you know what the common thread has been throughout the whole conversation is, okay, so we know that you believe that empathy matters for society and empathy matters within relationships and across boundaries of different people. But now you've also just talked about, you know, somebody empathizing with you in a very meaningful way, because it could have mattered in terms of how somebody ultimately um, evaluated you and, and your and your future potential as, as a physician. The common thread has been, and, and no surprise, but it's just, it's so, it's so sincere like across the board, if we practice more empathy, if we all practice more empathy, we will benefit, our relationships will benefit and our world will benefit. Like that's the bottom line I'm hearing. So with that, I wish you the best of luck with your final exams. We wish you the best of luck with your residency in Toronto. And thank you so much for the time. This was a really, really uh, lovely conversation, a very deep, meaningful conversation about purposeful empathy. And thank you very much, Shalom Antoine, for your time. Wow, absolutely. Thank you so much for your quality of attention and the questions you asked. Honestly, it's been a huge pleasure to, to be with you. Great. So with that, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next week at the next episode of Purposeful Now, what if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your own thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from whatever is holding you back? At Grand Here and International, you get to select a coach of your choice anytime from anywhere. Visit GrandHeronInternational.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.